Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for today, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would just be with us today as we listen to your word, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears to you, Lord. Open our mouths, Lord, that we would speak your word. Lord, help me to decrease so that you may increase. In your name, Lord, I pray and I thank you. Amen. Amen. So uh, this summer we've been going through the uh, uh, sword of the spirit, which is the word, and we've been learning how to actually uh, how to actually study and read our Bible, and we have been going through the uh, the coma method, comma method, and uh, we went through context, observation, message, main idea. Now we're talking about application. So I guess my sermon title would be, come on in and apply. I don't know. You ever get a job, come on in and apply? So that's kind of corny, but you know, you know, I, I'm a corny guy for the Lord. That's all right. Anyway, so when I was in uh, college, <clears throat> you know, Kiara's over pledged Delta last year, and we have some people out of college who have pledged fraternities and sororities. My father was an Omega. My mother was an AKA. Um, but when I was at South Carolina State, I pledged Catholic Kappa Psi, National Honorary Band Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, but one thing about uh, band life and I guess fraternity life as a band was for a whole month, we had to learn all this information. Day after day, night after night, had to learn information, had to learn words, Greek letters, all these things we had to learn about our fraternity, the founders, all of that. And then when, when we finally pledged and crossed, I guess, those burning sands, we were expect to live out what we were taught as band members. And if I were to put uh, KK Psy in a nutshell, what its, its goal in a nutshell would be the badman of the band and the betterment for music. So that means those who were Kappa Kappa Psi, they would be on time. When they got on the field, they would run, they would encourage other freshmen. They would do all that, they would memorize their music. And we did none of that. We did none of that. We weren't on time because we were KK Psi members, we could do whatever we want. Uh, we were talking during practice, we weren't really marching. But when it was time to party hop, we were there. When it was time to call, do the name call, we were there. I remember when my senior year, we were um, sort of doing interviews. And there was one guy who was named Tyrone. And there was another guy, I forgot his name. Well, he was, we, his, his uh, line name was incarcerated because he was a bad student. And he said he's going to be incarcerated eventually. So that was his line name, all right? and car Psy rated because KK Psy, all right. But anyway, this student was, I don't know if y'all remember Ronald J. Sargent, who, was, uh, who passed away years ago, it was his son. And so they both were interviewing. And so his son begins the interview, he comes up with his coat open, his dress coat open, he has a tank top on, he has a do-rag on, he has some slacks and tennis shoes. When he plays his instrument, his valves are dry, he uses a saliva to, to, to lubricate the valves, and the saliva falls on the stage, and we're like, what is going on? And he plays the music, and it's all wrong. And so when it's done, the, 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 all the old heads were like, yeah, that guy was pretty good. Oh yeah, he, he, he's good. And me and my friend Mike was like, no, he is not KK Psy. He doesn't even go to his own father's school, I mean, his own father's class. He doesn't come dressed out, he wears jeans, he doesn't practice, he plays all the time, he comes in late. And then there was another guy named Tyrone who comes up. They just didn't like Tyrone. But Tyrone played his music and afterwards they were like, well, we don't like him. And again, me and Mike were like, Tyrone, is KK Psy. Why? Tyrone applies it. He comes to practice 20 minutes before practice to practice. He literally runs his section and he's not even a section leader. He, he, he gives 100% he gives and he marches 
at 90 degree angles all the time. He is everything that we need. He actually has given and, and, and arranged music for us to play. And see, what I'm trying to say is that we learned all these things, but yet we didn't apply what we learned at all. You know, as a father, as a, as a, I guess, a father who is a Christian and aspiring to be a ordained pastor, you know, I, I think about my children a lot. And, you know, Alice gave his life to the Lord when he was like six um, at a vacation Bible school, and he's learning his word. We read him the Bible every day. We pray with him. Uh, he's learning to memorize the books of the Bible. Right now, he's le- he, he memorized 20 books in the Old Testament. But that's not my concern. I know he's going to get all that. My concern is how he sees how I live as a father who is a Christian. How am I going to live out what I have taught him? That's what I worry about. H- how do I address him? How do I address uh, uh, Latifia in front of him? How do I deal with things? How do I talk? Am I cursing in front of him? Am I, list- am I playing TV shows that has curse words? And, and one- I was one time. The other day, I was looking at the boondocks. That's how I show, right? Look at the boondocks, and they were just, and Latifah's like, do you, really? I'm like, he, he don't know about that. But that's not, that's me applying, me being, you know, see what I'm saying? So it's about me applying and living it out. And when I talk to college students about their Christian walk, the main reason why, and it's subjective, but the main reason why they struggle to be believers is because at their church, they see how their fellow church members live it out. And so they see it, and it makes them want to be like, oh, that's what you, and they sort of get discouraged from being believers. When we study and read the Bible, when we understand what Jesus is saying through his word, he has commanded us not to only hear it and study it, but to apply it and live it. And it's not just for ourselves. It's so that others can be a witness to the power of Christ in our lives. I think as Christians, this is one of the biggest problems. There was a a pastor who once said, we are Bible scholars, but practical atheists. So now we went through the common method, and we don't want to be practical atheists. And so as we go through the common method, we are now called to apply what we learn in our Bible studies, in our devotional time. How should God's word affect how I think, feel, and live? And we're going to go to his word, looking at Matthew 7, 15 through 20. And this is Jesus talking, and he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistle? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. So here Jesus is speaking of false prophets. And he tells them on the outside, you don't know. They're very appealing. But underneath, they're ravenous wolves. And and one thing you have to understand about false prophets, the Bible speaks of false prophets as dreamers. They speak things from their hearts. They're not speaking from God's word. And so since they're not speaking from God's word, it will apply in their life. And so that's what God is saying. You, you, will, you, will, you, will, you cannot recognize them unless they show themselves for what they are. Their fruit is, visual, is a visual aid that shows who they are. And Jesus begins this illustration of a fruit tree. He is saying that a fruit tree planted in good soil will yield an external physical reaction. It it is based on good soil, the roots, and its foundation. 
It's the same thing for a bad tree. It, 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 it will yield an external reaction based on its soil and the roots and the foundation. It was natural and an obvious reaction to a culture that was, that, that was agriculture. It was normal. There's another part of the gospel where Jesus says, let your light shine before men. Nobody puts a, a basket over a light. And of course, in those days, they didn't have like a light bulb. They had a, a candle, a flame. Of course, it would be obvious not to put a basket over a flame because the basket would burn. It's not meant to be covered. It's meant to be open. It's a logical reaction to the foundation. It's supposed to happen. And we are commanded to do it. But of course, Jesus isn't just talking about fruit. He is talking about those who place their foundation in him. And in that foundation, in that good soil, they will bear fruit. We too are called to show our fruit by living it out. Now, I think a lot of times we struggle to live out what we uh, have learned as believers because in this kind of day, we don't want to offend nobody. We don't want anybody to think that, oh, you are uppity Christian. Or a lot of people believe that, oh, you are Bible-thumping Christian. You're going, you, you're going to hell if you smoke. You listen to that, you listen to that R&B and that hip-hop LL Cool J music, oh, you're going to hell. That ain't God. But guess what? That's not the fruit that God is talking about. That's not showing your fruit. That's sort of like showing off. That's not showing fruit. Of course, fruit is appealing. It's appealing to people. Not, that's, Jesus is not saying, well, show your fruit. If you're a Christian, let people know and judge them. No. Even when you read Galatians, the fruits of the Spirit, chapter 5, all the fruits of the Spirit are interrelational, meaning they're about connecting to one another. If you read Galatians, Galatians is talking about how these Galatians, these Pharisees are backbiting. They're, they're dividing, and, and then Paul comes to the fruits of the Spirit and say, this is how we should live and treat one another. That's different. Let me give you an example. Again, going back to the band, there was a, there was a student who I meet with um, uh, periodically every, because he cannot come uh, to Bible study because he has band practice at six. And he's a section leader and, and a believer. And he told me that one time, one of his players stormed off, cursing him out, cursing out the entire thing. I'm mad, just walked out. Now, band logic, would, would mean that person needs to be cursed out, they need to be doing push-ups, that's what they need. But instead, he told me he went out to her, sat down, and spoke to her. Showed kindness, showed gentleness, and even the joy that he had with her as being a band student. And her heart tended to change towards it. He was showing that fruit. Does that make sense? You also read it in John 15, where Jesus says, love one another. They will know you by how you treat each other. Again, the fruit looks different. Don't I want anybody to feel that they can't show their fruit because they're being offensive. Though the gospel is offensive, it's still fruit that you have to show. So as we study our Bible, we must come to a place where we show our fruit and apply what we learn. So how should, we, how should we think about this Matthew passage? We should know that we can actually show our fruit, that it is a natural and obvious reaction being rooted in Christ. Sometimes you just can't help but to love people because you know how much Christ has loved you because his Bible teaches us so. And not only that, God commands us to do it. Think about how you react seeing a beautiful fruit tree. Think of how you react. My wife grows fruit, and she has all kinds of things, and once in a while I look outside, I miss the tall grass that I need to cut, I know, and I see her garden, I'm like, yeah, okay. It's appealing, though it's vegetables, you know, but it's still appealing. We can actually show the beauty of Christ by showing our fruit. How should you feel 
How should this passage make you feel? Those who are righteous should live righteously. You should have a deep desire to live righteously. If your faith, is in, if your faith in Christ is true, then show me. Show me that works of that faith. Show it to me if, it's, if you are a believer. Show me. Why not? How should we live? As a student, just since I'm doing my college, as a student, you can go to the party. But as a result of Christ accepting you, you don't have to anything to prove by going to the party and getting drunk or high. You have nothing to prove because you know what Scripture says, and you can apply it. As a result and of learning and accepting what we, should, what, what, we, what we should show our fruit by how we love one another, be there for your girls and boys when they are intoxicated and, and actually tell them to actually be a designated driver. Don't leave guys and girls alone at the party. Why am I saying that? Because I heard a lot of stories that that has happened, but they're called friends. As employees or a boss, you have, to learn, you, you, you have learned about learned about and have received God's grace. So you show others the grace at work to new employees. You show justice and, equal, and being equal in it. Or maybe you have learned and believed that Christ has patience with us. So we're sh- slow to anger. And so you apply it to your husband or to your wife and to your children. So let's look at a scripture. Let's look at an Old Testament scripture. Now we're going to go to our application. Let's have a little fun with this. If you're reading the Bible, we're going to go to an Old Testament scripture. And, and one thing I've done is, one thing I'm just saying, that I don't want anybody to ever feel intimidated by reading the Old Testament. I think a lot of us get intimidated by reading it because it's so much stuff, right? It's all this stuff, Abraham and Solomon and David and all this, and it's, it's like 100,000 chapters in Genesis and all this. It can get intimidating, right? I mean... I went through first and second kings like twice because I had to understand. And so it's just chronicles and songs. It can be intimidating sometimes, but I don't want you to feel intimidated by doing your own devotion on these books. Because the Coma Method does work. So we're going to look at, an, I guess, an Old Testament obscure passage sort of in, in the middle of the deep part of the Bible that, you know, maybe you heard about and it's like, I would never think that is there, right? So let's look at Numbers 22, 22 through 35. Is it up there? I don't know if it's up there. Did I put it up there? I didn't put it up there, did I? Man, that's my fault. But if you have your Bibles, you're cool, okay? So Numbers 22, 22 through 35, and it reads, But God's anger was kindled because he he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either, wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either right or left, to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And and Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff then here's where it gets kind of weird. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, he actually talks back to the donkey, and argues, because you made me a, made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey actually says back to Balaam, am I not your donkey? on which you have ridden your whole, your, all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he actually spoke back to the donkey and said, no. <laughs> then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way with a drawn sword in hand. And he bowed down and faced, 
and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now therefore, it is an evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the, the men, but speak only the word I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes to Balak. All right, there's a lot in there, is it? It's Old Testament, man, but the part with the donkey, you arguing with the donkey, you know, we argue with our dogs and cats all the time. Ain't nothing new. They just don't talk back, you know. So let's look at this. Let's, let's see what the context is. In order for you to get a context of most scriptures, you got to start at the beginning. You have to start at the beginning. If something doesn't make sense in one part of the verse, go back to the beginning. The context. If you were to read this text and go back to the beginning and ask yourself, what is the context? Well, the context is that Israel is in the promised land and they are cleaning house. They are wiping nations out. And Balak is a, Moab, a Moabite king who, who wants a sorcerer named Balaam to curse Israel. But God will keep his covenant with Israel who promised he would be blessed, that they would be blessed and not cursed. That's the context. Where's Numbers? Right here? Right here. Way back when. Old book. And is Numbers 22, 5 through 6, did I put that up there? Let's look at it. Is that up there? Numbers 22. I know I put it up there. It's not. I, I put all that work in on. It's not up there. Okay. Look at Numbers 22, 5 through 6. Look at your Bible. This is the context. Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite of me. Now come curse these people for me. Since they are too mighty for me, perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. That language, whom you bless, he's, this is Balak talking to Balaam, okay? And he says, I know those you bless will be blessed, and those who you curse will be cursed. But that's what God said. God has said that before. So now you get an understanding of the context, okay? This is kind of a long text. We're, we're not going to really break it down. It's pretty long, but so we're going to look at a few of these things. The observation. Let's look at the main scripture. If you look at Numbers 22, the, what we were looking at, the passage that we read, 22 through 35 for observation. We can look at a few things. Numbers 22, 22. Let's look at that. All right. I, I, if I'm going too fast or I'm stumbling, let me know. So Numbers 22, 22. But God's anger kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in his way as an adversary. So one thing we can observe, if you read the beginning of the text or the, if you go back, that God is angry with Balaam because he has made a choice to go curse Israel. Because he's getting paid. He's getting that money. So he's like, that money kind of good. I'm going to go do it anyway. I'm going to go do it anyway, and if you read in the beginning, God told him no. Three times, I believe. No, you're not going to do it. No. And God tells Balaam, these people are blessed. No. But Balaam says, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to go do it anyway. And he stands, and once you think, it, it says right here, and he sends an angel as his adversary. I, I love that because God is actually against Balaam. I'm against you now because you're going against what I have commanded, what I have told you what to do. Let's look at the, the, the script, the text, another one, Numbers 22, 23. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside of the road and 
and went to the field, and Balaam struck the donkey and turned aside into the road. And another thing we need to observe about this passage is that the donkey sees the angel, but Balaam does not, and he punishes the donkey for not listening. It would help if you observe that this is happening three times. It seems Balaam, is the, his, his determination is to disobey God. He's determined to disobey God. And this angel is standing in his way, trying to show him that God means no. God means no. He's, he's, God's going to be consistent. We'll get there. He's going to be consistent. And finally, if you look at Numbers 22, 28, then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And here is something that is significant to really observe. This is significant because if a donkey is talking, that has not been designed in creation to speak human tongue. Think about that. Animals don't talk. If you hear animals, go check yourself into the hospital because there's something wrong, okay? This is not Dr. Doolittle. That's Eddie Murphy. He's not a real doctor. He's an actor. God allows a donkey to speak. You have to ask yourself the question, why? This happens like one time in the entire Bible, I believe. I don't think any other animal spoke. One time in the whole Bible. Why would God want to do this? It's very important to the main idea. It's very important to the main idea, which we're going to look at. The main idea or the message is not, some of us might think, well, I think the main idea is you shouldn't be cruel to animals. Well, no, that's not the main idea. Yeah, you shouldn't be cruel, but that's not what God is saying. Well, God, oh no, I, mean, I know what God is saying. God is saying you got to keep your eyes open for angels because you never know. No, well, no, that's not the main idea. You have to look at the entire thing, right? The main idea is God is consistent and serious about keeping his promises through the covenant to, to bless Israel. It is so important to him. It, I want you to hear, it is so important to him that when Balaam tries his best three times to go against God, that God is like, oh my gosh, this dude can't get it. But God is so, he, he wants Balaam to see this so bad that he literally opens an animal's mouth. So Balaam can see and understand that God means business. No means no, yes means yes. I told you I'm going to bless Israel. I got to open the donkey's mouth so you can hear it? That's how serious God is about his covenant, about his people, about Israel. That's the main idea that God is consistent with his promise to Israel that he will bless them. And if you ain't listening, man... And you know what? I, I can see a lot of grace in this because Balaam could have been struck down and that donkey would have been like, oh well, and walk right away. Now that we have established in this passage the coma method, now we have to go to the application. H how do we think and feel and live if we were to read this passage? How should we think? We should believe and know that God is consistent and he will fulfill what he has promised in our lives. And anything, another thing we should, we should think about it is that we know that Jesus himself became a curse for us so that we can be blessed. I believe another thing that we should know is that God cannot be manipulated or persuaded no means no, yes means yes. And you got to, if you read the beginning of the passage, Balak kept, kept manipulating Balaam. Hey Amen, I'll give you more money. Send, he's not listening. God said, no, I know. Send him more money. Send him an, a, a, an array of our princes and, and important people. But God's not going to be manipulated by that. You can't tell God what you think he needs to do if God already said no or yes. You're not going to say, God, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give God and, and just do right. That's not going to manipulate him. We need to understand that. 
that nothing can manipulate him at all, even things that are against you. You know, my son, Alex, is, he, he's, a, he's a, a gamer like me. You know, he plays his game, I play my game. And sometimes we play together and he's always winning because I'm, I'm, I'm bad at his games. And so in one of his games, he, love, he loves Minecraft. He, he loves his game. And there is a level called the neither, okay? And so for our geek, peop, our geek folk, we know the neither means the realm of the dead or hell, right? And when I grew up, my mother didn't want me to get into games like that. And now I'm starting to see my mother in, in, in me when I'm talking to Alice. And Alice's like, I want to go to this level called the neither. I'm like, no. But, but daddy, it's, just, it's not that bad. It's like, no. But see, daddy, if I, I got to finish the game. But like, no, you're not going to persuade and manipulate me. No means no. And so I'm not saying no to Alice to be a jerk, to be a tough, uptight father. I'm not with the times. I'm not, you know, cool and, and suave and hip. That's not what it is. I love Alex. I don't want him to get into anything that would hurt him and deal with things. I don't want him to look at hell as a place of fun and games and jokes, and, and I don't want him to get into that. And the Lord is the same way. His no and his yes means because he loves you and he cares. How should this passage make us feel? One way we should feel is that those saved by God should be encouraged and confident because God is faithful even when we are not. He is working and faithful even when we don't even know it. If you look at this passage, this passage is like those Netflix TV shows where it's about the main character and like by episode four, it's about a side character that's connected to the main character. This is what this story sort of is because Israel has no idea that this is happening to them. This is a side story, and Balak is, is consulting with people, and Israel has no idea that there are people out there to hurt them. And God is like, I love people. I'm going to intervene, even when they have no idea. You have no idea that God is intervening in your life. Even when you're sleeping, God is working. You have no idea what he's doing on your behalf because he wants to keep his promise. There are people who are actually against you and want to hurt you. And God is saying, no, these are my children. And you don't even know it. We don't even know it. How should we live? As students, parents, employees, again, you can live in faith and confidence in Christ even when everything else in our lives are falling apart because your security is in the faithfulness of Christ. He cannot be changed and manipulated by conflicts in our lives. I think one thing we have to see is that God himself has taught the covenant and has made a covenant with Israel, but God himself lives out the covenant, actually lives out by sending his son Jesus, by fulfilling the covenant as an application to the covenant. Jesus himself even applies what he has upheld through his son Jesus, who has fulfilled the covenant for us, who has lived righteously, who has followed God righteously, who has, who has died for our sins, who has actually become a curse so that God again can bless Israel. That's important. We can live in faithfulness of Christ. I know some of us wake up in the morning and we swing our legs to the side you know, you want to get out of bed, and we sit up and we're like, Ooh, why am I doing this again? I don't know, maybe that's just me. <laughs> maybe that's just me. You know, I don't know, but I do that. Why? And then the Holy Spirit has to remind me because God is good. And God is, is working through you. And that he wants, he wants to work through others. His faithfulness is what helps me swing those legs around and stand up and actually in the middle of it, still tired, and hear Lee, Liam screaming out because he lost a flashlight. And I'm like, Lord, <laughs> okay. Maybe that's just me, I don't know. I can't say that enough. 
that we truly can live in confidence because of the faithfulness of Christ throughout Scripture. It has been demonstrated through the actions of God and his people, who was Christ. Again, but the greatest act that God has ever done, the greatest application where his faithfulness is evident is the cross. That Jesus died for our sins despite of how we acted, how we rejected him. And he rose again from the dead, furthering that faithfulness into him. Death can't hold him anymore. Therefore, nothing can sway him. He is faithful. So we can actually live, think, as we study our word, as we study our word and we're going through the coma method and it's time to apply, we can know now how to think, feel, and live. And all of that is tied up in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you have come down through the prophets, through the dreams and visions, through your Psalms, and have revealed your word, your absolute word to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that through your written word that we can, that you have given us through your grace and faith that we can look, open your word and study and learn it. And not only learn it, Lord, you have given us through your word the ability to apply it. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you will strengthen us and encourage us through your word that we've learned how to apply it to every situation in our lives. In the name, Lord, we pray. Amen.